Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Uh, so my name is Drew Fastini, and I wanted to talk about uh, Linux on RISC-V, um, which are a few things that I'm quite excited about. Um, so when you write a program, like for example, in the Arduino IDE or whatever IDE you might be using for programming, um, if it's a language like C, it gets compiled into instructions that run on uh, the microcontroller on your processor. Um, but how does the compiler know instructions that your chip understands? Um, this is defined by the instruction set architecture, or ISA. So it's a set of rules that defines what tasks the processor can perform. Um, so examples of this you probably have heard of would be x86, which refers to Intel AMD's um, common instruction set that's on all of our desktops and laptops and servers. Um, and then ARM, so if you have a smartphone with you, um, it is most definitely running an ARM processor. So ARM is another example of an instruction set. Now, both of these are proprietary. Um, and if you want to use them, you need to have a commercial license from ARM or with Intel and AMD, it might not be possible to get a license. Um, so about 10 years ago at the University of California, Berkeley, there was a computer architecture uh, research group there. Um, and in order to do their um, research into computer architecture, um, they didn't want to be constrained by having to license some commercial ISA. So they created um, a new instruction set called RISC-V. Um, this is the fifth RISC architecture that had come out of Berkeley, um, going all the way back to the 80s. Um, and then, uh, so essentially the RISC-V ISA is free and open for anyone to use. Um, it's licensed under a Creative Commons um, license. Um, I'm not, this is just a lightning talk, so I can't go into everything. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, Megan Wax uh, from Sci5 gave a great talk at the Hackaday Super Conference last year um, and uh, goes into Risk Five and also FPGAs, which I'm going to just talk about very briefly. Um, also wrote a column in Hackspace Magazine. It's a, a free magazine that you can download online. Um, go a little bit more into what Risk Five is, so you can check that out, check that out as well. Um, and then specifically what I wanted to talk about was when we were at the Hackaday conference last year in November, everyone at the conference got this um, badge here, which I'll hold up to the camera. So if you, I don't know if you can see this, but um, this was the badge everyone got. And the idea was you could wear it around your neck and have animations with your name and, and video games and stuff like that. So a really cool badge, um, but we thought, hey, uh, it'd be nice if it ran Linux. Um, so a group of us got together and tried to do that. Um, now, what was on the badge is not a normal processor, it's an FPGA. Um, so an FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. Um, and this is a sea of logic gates, like the one on this chip has 45,000 gates. Um, and we can configure that to be any sort of digital logic that we want to design, including a processor. Um, and go a little bit more into FPGAs if you want to know about that, uh, including the really exciting world of open source tools for FPGAs. I uh, wrote another column in Hackspace that you can download for free if you want to check that out. Um, also, at the end, I'll share a link to the slides. There's um, links in, all the, in the PDF for everything. Um, so this uh, um, FPGA that was on the badge was an ECP5 FPGA from a company called Lattice. And there's an open source tool chain for it, which means that we don't have to download some gigantic proprietary piece of software just to load things onto the FPGA, we can use these op open source tools, which is very exciting. Um, and then specifically, how did we um, create a soft core that can be loaded into the FPGA? We leveraged this project called LIDEX. Um, so LIDEX is based on um, a framework called MeGen for Python. And this allows us to actually do chip design um, in Python. So you might have heard of Verilog or VHDL, these are hardware description languages that you typically use for FPGAs. Um, but instead of those languages, in this case, you can use Python, um, which I found to be quite powerful. Um, so MeGen is this Python framework that allows us to do, um, essentially describe digital circuitry in Python. Uh, and then LIDEX builds upon that and has a set of um, cores 
and different peripherals that we need for building a full system on chip. In this case, something that had a serial port and a um, DRAM controller. You can find more about it on uh, Lidex's um, GitHub there. Um, here's a nice little diagram of it. So MiGen is that uh, Python language for doing chip design. Um, and then it also ties into those open source FPGA, FPGA tool chains that um, the, the an analogy to compiling our source code um, with the processor is we do a thing called synthesis of FPGA. So the way that we actually take that um, hardware description language and turn it into something that can be loaded onto the FPGA is with a synthesis tool. Um, so it pulls all these things together. Um, and specifically, uh, there's a program called Linux on Lidex VexRisk. So VexRisk is a small 32-bit capable um, RISC-V CPU. So it's a processor design that can be loaded into an FPGA that is running the RISC-V instruction set. And it supports the ability to run Linux on it. Um, and then with Lidex, we're able to grab the other bits of chip design that we need. So DRAM controller, we're not using it on this design, but on other boards, you have Ethernet controller, PCI Express controller, even SATA. Um, so if you have a more capable FPGA board, you could pull in other functionality as well. Um, with this batch project, we basically just had a serial port and uh, DRAM. So this was us at a uh, Hackaday Super Conference um, trying to get um, the batch to run Linux. Um, and uh, big thanks to the, the people that helped out. Um, Michael Welling, Tim Ansel, um, Sean Cross, and Jacob. In particular, we, we have Jacob to thank for having thought ahead and having designed this little board. So on the back of the badge, there was an expansion port uh, meant for if you wanted to attach additional hardware. Jacob, before the conference, decided, hey, I'll make a board that has uh, additional RAM. In this case, we needed it because we weren't able to run Linux on the built-in 16 megabytes of memory. We needed the uh, external DRAM, which so this came in really handy um, at the conference. Uh, and this is what the badge looks like. Um, so on the front, there's the screen on the back side is where we have the expansion port plugged in with that 32 megabytes of DRAM. And this is what it looks like uh, connected to a terminal emulator on my laptop. Um, and this is what it looks like when the soft core inside the FPGA then goes and boots Linux. And uh, after we got back from the conference, uh, I wanted to make sure that this was upstreamed into the LightX project. So I went through and figured out all the little things we did to get it to work um, at the conference. So um, well, you may not have this badge, but if you want to take a look at what does it look like if you have another FPGA board and you want to get um, Linux and LightX running on it, uh, you can take a look at this. Um, and to give you a flavor, I think it's important to show you that um, if you're familiar with Python, it's much easier to understand what's going on here. Um, whereas I don't, not really very experienced with VHDL or Verilog. Um, so here's an example of, um, for our board, we, we took an existing board and we copied it and then changed what was specific to this badge. So things like uh, the pins that we have here. So these are called the pin constraints, kind of mapping uh, what pins we have go to which peripherals in the FPGA. Um, and as you can see, it's all just Python. Um, so understandable from anyone that understands Python syntax, there's things that are specific to this uh, LIDEX framework and the, the, the MeGen language that's um, using Python. But uh, at least it's, it's um, easy to look at um, at a glance, I think, uh, more than a Verilog or VHDL for most people that come from a software background. Um, and here's taking a look at, um, we have, we're pulling in things like um, clocks and SDRAM uh, and uh, this, we're building up our system on chip um, using these Python modules. Uh, and one of the other things that we had to do was uh, add a definition of what our board was. Uh, so we copied one of the existing ones and just added in what we had. Um, and then how do we load onto the batch the specific um, output of our FPGA tools? Um, and then one of the other nice things was, so we had this 32 megabyte SD RAM chip. And um, normally you'd have to potentially write a bunch of Verilog or VHDL to get a new DRAM chip working. In this case, we can leverage the object-oriented na nature of Python and just um, copy an existing class and then change it to the specific settings that are in the data sheet for this SDRAM module. So kind of leveraging the uh, object-oriented uh, nature of Python. One of the fun things was it was running really sl uh, slow. It was going 300 seconds to boot up. I posted a GitHub issue and Laurent who does, um, or Florence, sorry, that does the LIDEX um, GitHub, he responded with a fix that made it run 10 times faster, which was really cool. Um, here's a little movie of what it looks like for Linux to boot on it. Uh, and then we've been working on optimizing the performance. Um, and 
Greg here, um, who's a, an awesome hacker in Australia, he got the display working finally. So here we have a VGA terminal on the LCD, so you can actually see Linux booting up um, without having to have it connected to your computer. Um, and then real quick, just some bonus slides here. Um, Greg has went on to make an open source hardware board. So this badge was just for people at the conference, but if you wanna get a, a, a Linux capable FPGA board, um, this open hardware, the Orange Crab just launched on GroupGets, um, crowdfunding campaign there. Um, and it does run Linux as Greg shows here. Uh, and then there's also this Radiona board from a hackerspace in Croatia. Um, and that's also up for crowdfunding right now. So if you wanna get started on your own, um, there's that. And real quick here, um, there are some chips, not just FPGAs that can run uh, Linux on RISC-V. One is from a company called Sci-5. Um, they just did this board as kind of an evaluation. So it's not something that is generally avail available yet, but it is a quite capable board. Um, and people at um, Fedora are, are using it to get um, Fedora running on RISC-V. Um, and then also we have Debian as well has a port for RISC-V. Um, and then a very inexpensive board is, has a processor on it called the Kendrite, the Kendrite K210. So this is a board that you can get for $13 from Cyped, and it has a dual core 64-bit um, RISC-V processor, but it only has eight megabytes of SRAM. Um, so someone named Davian Lamal at Western Digital worked a bunch to get it working on there. Um, so you can get one of these $13 boards and boot Linux on it as well. Uh, and maybe next year we'll have some more boards, but that's all we have for now. Um, and I'll leave it on the end here, um, which is the, the link to the slides. Okay, so uh, here's a question. Are there any affordable risk uh, five boards or risk V boards available for hacking? How is the tool chain support? Yeah, so um, let me go back here to, so the, the CyP board um, with this Kendrite chip is probably the best bet right now. Um, this one's $13 and this one has more peripherals, it's $40. Um, and they're both supported by um, Lin mainline Linux kernel now. Um, so the great thing about RISC-V is we have support in GCC, Clang, LLVM. Um, so all the kind of the existing open source tool chains, a lot of them support it now. Um, so there's pretty good support. There's limited um, silicon. Um, so this is one, one, uh, one way to do it. Um, the other way is with an FPGA board like I was showing. Um, and the third way is with QEMU. So anyone that wants to right now can go download Fedora or um, uh, Debian and run it in QEMU on their computer. Great, thank you. And we, we also have a second question. Where, where does RISC-V fit in, so to speak? What, what does it replace performance-wise? Uh, I mean, it's, it's bigger than an 18 mega, which is one of the alternatives here, but where do you see it? Does it replace ARM, x86? What does it do? What doesn't it? Well, um, I think the idea with RISC-V was to be an open instruction set that could handle any sort of um, computing needs. So they have a small 32-bit um, version for embedded uh, microcontrollers all the way up to um, full 64-bit, and they even have an option to do 128-bit if we ever need to address that much memory. So. It's meant to be an open instruction set that um, anyone could use for everything from a small microcontroller to a smartphone to a server. Um, now that's just the instruction set. Um, the implementations, there's many different ones. There's some open ones, there's some proprietary ones. Um, for right now, like Alibaba is doing server clash chips with it. Um, there's also a lot of commercial microcontrollers that are being built with it. I think a gap right now is to have like this sort of um, system on chip that you need for doing um, something like a phone or a laptop. We don't necessarily have that sort of performance yet. Um, kind of have some big chips and then some smaller ones. So, uh, but it, the instruction set itself is just the, um, the instructions that the processor um, implements. So it's kind of agnostic to the performance. Cool. Thank you very much.